Land Care Network. And in collaboration with them, we have um, brought to this program to you, this webinar series, Land Care More Than Planting Trees, Sustainable Ag, West of the Blue Mountains, Land Care also plant trees, but they also have a lot more to do with sustainable ag. And this program's um, working on highlighting that. Um, today, we've got Bruce Maynard, the 2022 Bob Hawk Lane Care Award winner, presenting with us. Um, to get started, I'd like to acknowledge the country that we all meet on here today and pay my respects to the Aboriginal custodians and owners of this land um, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm a Wiradjuri country, and in their words, Nanana, Yindamara, Huali, Nirmbungu, to acknowledge, care for, look after, and respect country. We are recording this uh, webinar today. So if you have, um, by staying on, you're agreeing to have the recording happen. And um, it is a pleasure for me to um, introduce Bruce Maynard. I've been really fortunate to um, have worked with Bruce over the last 17 years. And I'd have to say during my career in um, agriculture and natural resource management, working with Bruce has um, provided with me with some of the most amazing programs where we've seen change on the land, change with the landholders, um, real second order change in their um, lives. And to me, that's what um, Ag Extension is all about. And it's a thrill to have you with us, Bruce. Um, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz, and uh, it has been uh, my pleasure and uh, honour to uh, work with uh, yourself and uh, so many others in uh, the the journey and um, a very privileged position. I, I feel that I've had been very, very fortunate indeed, and uh, uh, it is, uh, in a way, land care is a, a gift uh, that keeps giving uh, from my point of view that I constantly keep on uh, uh, getting to meet uh, and know uh, people from all sorts of walks of life who are genuinely interested in uh, progress, uh, not only the ecological side, but communities, businesses that sit amongst them. So uh, I feel very, very privileged and uh, uh, let's launch into uh, the, the program to give uh, as much time as possible for uh, additional questions and discussion at the, at the end. So uh, I imagine that uh, for people uh, wanting to uh, submit a, a question, if you use the, the chat function, and uh, Liz can uh, look at those. And uh, so uh, uh, today, um, uh, what I'd like us to uh, uh, focus on is uh, uh, genuinely the, um, the pathways, the solutions um, to, um, uh, to us uh, uh, moving uh, to address challenges. So there are challenges that we face uh, and uh, are different than uh, uh, historical uh, uh, challenges that previous generations have faced, but that uh, uh, can be seen as a, uh, uh, as a threat or, uh, of course, an opportunity for us to be creative and, uh, and move things forward in a pra practical, profitable and logistically simple way. So uh, I was very fortunate this uh, past year to win the, the Bob Hawke uh, Award, which is uh, uh, done biannually and um, uh, my view in the uh, broad going around Australia is that land management is the place to be. It's really exciting uh, to be involved in things that can actually make a positive difference with all of the uh, usual doom and gloom that comes to us all via the media and uh, uh, increasingly by the internet. Uh, it's uh, often easy to overlook the, the fact that, that plenty of people are, are trying various things, and that's to be applauded. Uh, however much the um, uh, large or small the steps are, uh, we really need to celebrate the fact that, that people are, are trying and we, we need to keep looking to the future as our pathway of what we can uh, achieve going forward. So obviously there are some, some challenges and uh, uh, that, that slide there is some, uh, just a top 10 um, uh, risks as as listed by uh, uh, an esteemed world body and and just what i'd like to point out on the right hand side there is five of the things are environmentally based uh, there's other 
other things that, uh, that on a global scale, we uh, uh, will be impacted by, whether we like it or not, we are always, of course, buffeted by other things that are, aren't foreseen. And I guess the recent COVID times was a, a good example of, uh, of that. Uh, even the best clairvoyance didn't predict that one. And uh, the consequences of it will still be felt for, for quite a period of time. But what we can do is work on the, uh, the things that are within our uh, control, which is our day-to-day -day, um, activities across the, the landscape, while, um, uh, while recognising that what is really verifiable and, and happening, and I've thrown up this, this graph just as a, a generalised example there, uh, reflecting on on climate change and and uh, and the fact of uh, quite reasonable uh, scepticism uh, and so we should maintain that all the time with uh, with any knowledge. But how have the uh, the models been faring compared to the observed global temperatures? And so the very dark line there is the observed global temperatures, and then that's all various different lines of of models. Some some of which are um, uh, coincide more closely than others, but in general, we we can see a trend, and that's what I believe we generally should be uh, working towards most of the time. That's what helps our decision making when we can identify trends in whatever uh, we are doing or seeing. That's then uh, somewhere we can operate with in the real world, rather than necessarily understanding the ultimate detail in any particular. Um, set of uh, facts. So uh, from uh, my point of view, um, uh, uh, we can see the risks and the, and the challenges, but what are the opportunities? There's where, it, it, for me, it's exciting to think about how can we creatively uh, come about and make opportunities for ourselves individually and our families and our businesses, which support us, but also feed into positive results for our communities and landscapes and 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 people, and that's once again why land care for me over the years has been an exciting field to be involved in, because it's just a never-ending and unfolding uh, uh, journey of people doing all sorts of of uh, of things. So, what this introduction today is is just about some of the constructive agricultural methods that I've been involved in and how they then broadly affect the agroecology more widely in our immediate communities and landscapes, but also uh, broader. And the quote uh, at the bottom of the screen there, the agricultural industry swamps farmers with what to do rather than how to think, I think is all, all the more apparent nowadays. There's uh, so much, if you like, guruism or uh, can I just have the uh, uh, the silver bullet that solves my particular issues? Uh, I'd encourage everybody to say, keep on looking for silver buckshot, uh, many answers and, and tools at your disposal rather than singular fixes, because generally speaking, in a complex biological system, single fixes aren't usually uh, uh, the means towards the end that we, we want. So, Here's a slide here, which is just comparing, well, what's happening now in general with our, uh, our landscapes and the way we're operating our agricultural systems across the world. So please, uh, people shouldn't take this as a personal affront to anything that you're doing now. It's just, let's look at the trends. What are, are current agricultural systems tending to do? especially since the Second World War, this rate of these impacts has increased. So what we've seen over that, that time is, of course, uh, reduced diversity in the, the landscape. Our rural communities have got smaller. There is less profitability across the agricultural industries, and that's sometimes something that is challenged when I'm in group settings. But uh, a clear understanding of any industry, is it more profitable than less profitable? Uh, an industry is more profitable if you have more and more participants joining into it. That is a clear sign of deep profitability. When you have less and less participants in it, then that is a clear sign of overall decline in profitability. So, of course, everybody would be aware of uh, how much our numbers of 
farmers actively engaged in, in farming has declined and continues to decline. That inevitably is leading to a, a lesser support base for our communities in general. What I would uh, really like to encourage is uh, we want thriving communities as well as our farms. It's no good if the only answer is less and less farmers of a bigger and bigger scale, because inevitably that l leads to smaller and smaller communities, which means that uh, in the long run, there isn't a win there anyway for the remaining farmers because the cost base completely drives up. And at the same time, uh, measurably by almost all standards, uh, the food that we've been uh, producing, especially out of Western uh, agricultural methods, has seen a decline in its overall nutrient diversity and density, two different things there. But uh, that is uh, an issue as we can keep on simplifying our food provision systems, then we keep on narrowing the sets of nutrients that we all actually consume as food there at the at the end. So those trends have been ongoing and are still there. But meanwhile, productivity has soared. Absolutely, it, it certainly has, but so has inputs. So if we want to be in a different place, then fundamentally, we need to start thinking hard about the systems that we operate over the, the top to actually reverse the trends uh, and shift those about. If you, uh, if you uh, have a, uh, a sole aim of uh, higher and higher productivity, well, then you are going to get more and more of those four downward arrows and your inputs are going to go up. That The chasing of that goal will inevitably keep on giving you the same results that we're all well aware of and can see around us. So creatively, again, let's think about different systems that isn't um, making this a, a black and white argument either that we just ditch everything or throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's be more positively creative on, on that. And so where this comes into play in the landscape is uh, perhaps thinking of Telling your businesses upwards rather than necessarily outwards or intensifying them. So this could be by the addition of uh, different plants across your, your landscape. In the, the case that you're looking at there, you've got various layers that I've instituted on our particular place where we have trees and we have shrubs and we have uh, retaining our older stands of, of uh, existing remnant trees all in the same landscape and increasing productivity at that same time. Because there is no value proposition for you if I was to suggest, yes, go and uh, plant some trees on your place, but start to decline the profitability of your uh, property. That's not really much of an option or only an option for a few that can uh, afford to subsidize that from outside. So I'm making the case that think about creatively uh, placing trees, shrubs, and a diversity of other plants in a grassland layer in ways that actually uh, either uh, uh, add to your business or even better still, multiply the benefits to your business. So just for a moment resting on that, that picture, before the addition of the trees and shrubs there in that picture, it was a, a grassland. So we had changed our grazing management to get more and more diversity on that grassland layer. And that is good, but and uh, also led to greater productivity of, of the number of livestock we could uh, have on the landscape. But once we added a certain proportion of shrubs and a certain proportion of trees across there, then we got even more benefits. So we actually have grown even more grass, even though some of the area is occupied by trees and shrubs. So think about how trees and shrubs, of course, uh, affect the wind flows and the evaporation rates between them. So uh, they rapidly uh, affect the uh, evaporation rates and, uh, and also physical wind damage that uh, plants uh, have at the grassland layer. So there is where we're starting to see synergies of adding pieces into the puzzle without taking stuff away. So this next photo um, uh, uh, shows 
from an aerial view. Oh, sorry, go back there and um, uh, and just various layouts. Now, uh, uh, from some of the uh, case studies we've had, and uh, oftentimes people are really intrigued by the uh, circular patterns that we've put in or the spiral patterns of, of shrubs and uh, uh, and other different shapes. We've done herring bones, concentric squares, uh, triangular shapes, all sorts of funny different experiments. If you want, um, uh, here's a, a shortening up rather than you guys having to do all the experiments. If you have the, uh, the possibility and it is practical for your farm situation, think about putting plantings in curves rather than straight lines. Now, the reason for that, if, as you're looking at that photo there of that concentric circles, which is quite an intensive pattern, I'm not suggesting that everywhere, but just if you look at any of those curves, which of course get broader and broader as they go out towards the edge of the, uh, of the circles there, any planting put in a curve provides a bigger benefit than ones planted in straight lines. So uh, the, how that plays out in the landscape is think about wind flows across your, your landscape, think about the shading during the day and all the small little creatures that go about their work in your paddocks. If planted uh, uh, woody vegetation in particular is planted in a curve rather than just straight, then you get a bigger bang for your buck from the biological side. Now, that's important for you on a business point of view, because if we've got that real estate there, well, we want to try and make the most use of the vertical real estate beneath our feet. And in order to do that, a diversity of plants brings more and different nutrients at different times in different concentrations to the soil surface. So therefore, you're actually starting to maximise your nutrient return and therefore the foundations of a continuing nutrient cycling and fertility renewal on that site, rather than if it was just grassland or if it was just shrubs or if it was just trees. We're after systems that give you the maximum edge effect, which increases the biology in all sorts of different layers. So even in very, very tough times, such as the uh, times between uh, 2017, 18 and 19, where it was exceedingly bad, beneath the surface, things are still ticking over. So you have biological activity just remaining there, ready to bounce and expand at rapid rates when you do get moisture. So all of these pieces fit together. They don't have to be intensive as uh, uh, in this uh, picture in front of you, but how is it if we were meeting one-on-one -on -one and we were talking about how applicable is this to your, your place? How can we think about some base principles here? We want to maximize the edge effect of different plantings that we're putting on your your property, whether that be right at the grass level and we place different plants in amongst that, that um, uh, situation so that um, they, um, uh, they provide edge effect right at that small level or at the broader level of tr with trees and, and shrubs. So uh, trying to be in the green and not be in the red isn't a, um, a proposition anymore. You can be in the purple in between and, and not an either or, but let's do, do both. So when uh, we uh, have a look at um, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, these. Uh, uh, two uh, things here. I want to just uh, briefly go on to some of the things that I've innovated. And one of them was uh, no-kill cropping. And this little paddock walk here, if your um, uh, internet is good enough to uh, be taking on your, this little walk, is a degraded paddock for 100 years that had been right next to a shearing shed and yards. And so that was what was the ground level was like without no-kill cropping applied. And then here is a single application of no-kill cropping to uh, get the start of a whole heap of processes. So there's the comparison. That had been subject to holistic management grazing for a number of years. 
and was slowly starting to repopulate because it was very bare when it first started. But then here is the application of over the top on top of that without subtracting and taking away pieces of the whole biology, applying no-kill cropping as a restoration tool. So in this particular case, and it's a really good example, and if you're wondering where this is, this is uh, in from um, Geraldton, uh, uh, about uh, two and a half hours uh, inland to the east from there in Western Australia, of starting up a process. It's about getting organic matter, of course, above and below the ground in the cheapest possible uh, way. And so no-kill uh, cropping uh, is a way of uh, applying this and getting a, a greater amount of biological activity. And so in these two, two photos, the one on the left is an unsown strip where the dog is, and then the sown grassland to the, to the left. So that's what uh, happens when you add over the top um, no-kill cropping into a, a grassland. So effectively, what we're doing there is adding cream to the cake without taking layers of cake away. And the right-hand picture that you can see there behind a harvester, and uh, that was um, uh, taken uh, last year as an example. So a very wet spring and really benign um, conditions, really showing you that we've kept all the components of that grassland, but still grown a crop in it. So uh, we haven't used any simplification uh, techniques. And this is where no-kill cropping, uh, as far as a systems uh, analysis, sits out differently from all other cropping systems on the, the tree of, of uh, possible uh, cropping that you may apply. It doesn't use simplification for its processes to drive crop production. It actually uses complementarity and synergistic uh, effects of a whole grassland to grow, in essence, our, our uh, introduced weed that we're putting in there, which we get to harvest and sell and, uh, and still retain everything. So it's a really, really multi-layered and interesting uh, thing there. And just as an aside, it's leading to more new products because uh, now not only are we able to a bale, grow bales after that, that sort of a harvest situation. So they aren't grass or straw anymore. They're a combination. So that's where the name comes from. But then also the other finer material that, that's harvested through the, um, uh, the header is uh, used now and uh, has great interest from uh, some of the brewers, believe it or not, because it is so diverse, because it re retains the fragments of up to 100 different species of plants, that's why they're interested in it, because it isn't simplified. It's actually something very, very complex and, of course, would vary from, from year to year. So uh, some uh, uh, little bits of, of video here at, at harvest uh, time. And uh, so this is uh, last year, and then we'll show you one from uh, uh, this year. And uh, uh, as you can see, still a total grassland left there. And one of the, the main principles of no kill, which sets it apart too, is that the fact that the machinery is going over the ground when it is at its uh, strongest. So, uh, uh, so not only the, um, the sowing, but also the harvesting is done when the soil um, uh, is at a dry condition, not moist. And particularly with the sowing uh, operation and seeding operation, that's a really, really important point. There's pretty much every other um, uh, cropping method relies on moist sowing applications. And that means that you're actually traveling across the, uh, the landscape at the time where the soil can be most damaged. Now, we all know that uh, if you're going down to uh, see uh, the road workers and what they do to compact a road, they'll moisten up the soil and compact it and run over it with machinery. They don't make it completely wet nor completely dry because you don't get maximum compaction then. They make it moist. And that is one of the big implications of what is happening with conventional uh, cropping uh, systems. And uh, there was a recent analysis, and you can Google this up 
uh, online, which was really interesting because some uh, analysts did the, uh, the uh, comparison on soil impact of dinosaurs versus modern machinery. And the bad news is our modern machinery is, is compacting and impacting soils, especially when they're moist, at uh, rates much heavier than any dinosaur that ever trod the earth. So the weight of machines has expanded uh, at a ratio higher than the, uh, the width of the tyres or uh, tracks on machinery and so forth. So we have some really big implications here long term, not just for us, but for future generations. If we are compacting soil at depth, and that's what they found, that uh, some of those impacts go down many metres, then that isn't something that's easily rectified, even if you're growing a lot of plants. That takes a long time to undo. So with no kill, you're, uh, uh, you're traveling over the, the ground when it's dry. And uh, so therefore it's greatest uh, strength. Plus of course, retaining all the plants across the landscape means that you're retaining the full sponge-like and support structure underneath the ground, not just the, uh, the physical dirt itself. It's actually buffered of course, by the maximum amount of root, root mass plus uh, all the channels and so forth, that all the little uh, bugs and, and uh, critters that we see and the ones that we can't see are constantly working in those, uh, those circumstances. So very low risk option uh, as well uh, in that uh, uh, a general sort of uh, rule of thumb you could uh, take at the moment, depending upon where you, uh, uh, you sit in the nation and your exact figures and that sort of thing. But to apply this probably only needs you to yield something like about 400 kilos per hectare of grain at standard price for it to be worth, worthwhile. So it's a really, really interesting additive. And if we get time at the end, we can also uh, talk about the dietary diversity that we have changed in that landscape as well with the, uh, with the animals, because we've put a high nutrient low toxicity plant in across that landscape, which the animals can then mix with other plants that have the opposite ratio of higher toxicity and lower nutrients. They can start to make use of more plants across the, the landscape. And if they do, of course, they've just increased the cycling again of nutrients back onto the soil for future, future plant growth. And so that brings us on to um, uh, how we handle animals across the landscape. And uh, this work that I've been doing for over 20 years now with uh, developing up the level three uh, competencies. So this is a development along and sometimes confused and people um, uh, quite understandably confuse this with low stress stock handling. So low stress stock handling is a level two competencies. Um, the stress-free stockmanship are level three. And where that's important is because the interplay of uh, animal behavior uh, affects every which way that grazing management uh, applies across the landscape. So uh, many years ago, I, uh, for two and a half years, I was the uh, uh, conservation grazing officer for land care in the central west New South Wales and uh, uh, Lachlan regions. And it was a really great time for me to go about, but very interesting for me to reflect that lots and lots of people that had um, uh, attended grazing management of the, um, of the three different uh, uh, themes that had uh, uh, are still uh, put out, but uh, it wasn't a high percentage of people having high levels of success, which was interesting for me personally, because we'd had such success on our own uh, property. and. And that really has um, uh, driven me on to uh, understand at a deeper level the behavioural aspects of uh, animals ever since, because that overlays whatever we're doing, whatever infrastructure you're doing and whatever grazing management approach you're taking, behaviour of both the humans and the animals is an interplay that is enmeshed in that. And so when we're thinking about uh, grazing, think about it that in, in some ways it's a poor word to describe three quite distinctly different things. Of course, the animals consume 
material, and that's one of the effects they have on the, the landscape, but also their physical impact by their hooves is another part of the grazing that we can uh, manipulate and uh, and also make it either beneficial or degrading, but also think about nutrient flow. Where they deposit the dung and urine across the landscape is also a large part of, of what uh, cycling and importantly for your business point of view, uh, the productivity of your grassland. So if we are actually taking an active role in changing the way animals are distributed across the landscape, then we fundamentally start to change the amount of grass you grow, the amount of landscape cover we have, and the amount of diversity. So your uh, uh, interplay with your higher levels of, uh, of st uh, stockmanship skills are a lead in to obtaining more from whatever money you've spent on fencing or wire or any other approaches you've, you've done or, um, or interventions you, uh, you go and do with the animals, even to medicines and so forth. Animals that have higher levels of anxiety um, aren't as effective as, as um, at metabolizing the drenches or dips that you might apply to them and those sort of examples. So this comes across and, and interplays with everything in it its importance can't be underestimated. And so that brings on to uh, the level four competencies, which are self-herding, which uh, was developed by Dr. Dean Ravel and myself uh, uh, just under 10 years ago now. And a lot of our work has uh, been in the rangelands because the broader the area you have, when you are redistributing animals across the landscape, the bigger the gain you uh, potentially can have. And so what we have been able to uh, manage and show and many, many landholders have been able to achieve is that you can get redistribution of animals by choice, not by force. So this is fundamentally different than applying grazing management and using fences as babysitters to uh, uh, confine animals to certain portions of the landscape and then moving them on. The slide on the, on the left, is week one versus week 13 on uh, some work we did up at, at Kidman Springs Experiment Station in the Northern Territory, uh, right next to Victoria River Downs, if people want to know. Uh, so uh, a bit uh, westward from Catherine. And uh, uh, the center portion of that paddock as exposed in the right-hand photo was very heavily de uh, degraded uh, due to geological processes, but also prior uh, grazing from a long, long time, and that's in that white section. And so, what the managers on the uh, on the site uh, told us was that uh, they hadn't um, uh, ever much uh, uh, seen the animals in the uh, sections in the underutilized uh, areas indicated on that uh, on that graph. And so, here on the the right, for those uh, that that can see the uh, the video. Uh, and looking at the, the top, it's a changing uh, um, representation of where the animals are at different times of the day. And, uh, and so the stronger the colour, the more the, the, the animals are there. So we actually had um, GPS collars uh, uh, beaming up to satellites on a number of different animals. And it's really interesting and fun to see that, that uh, by choice, they're occupying different places of your landscape at different times. But the little red stars that you can see that especially are, are associated with the, um, uh, the bottom left-hand border of the, uh, of the paddock were where the uh, uh, attractant station signals were uh, put for the animals. So the way we get the animals to move around the landscape by choice is in fact initiating addictive behaviors. And what I mean by that is what we're setting up is more like a poker machine response rather than a smorgasbord. So we're not just taking lollies around the landscape to get this result. We're actually getting the animals to, um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, change in a way so that they go to uh, our... Um, uh, our uh, 
uh, signals that we're we're putting up, rather than um, rather than just um, uh, uh, be uh, be going uh, to where they habitually go. And so um, uh, that is the uh, the point of grazing management in total is that if um, if we just leave the uh, uh, the animals to do what they are going to do, then they are creatures of habit just as us. And so therefore they will over and under utilize uh, areas of the landscape. And so that's what we're seeking to, uh, uh, um, to change by having an active role in taking them to other places that they wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, uh, is saying that that if you imagine your your property and you've got the option of uh, and I'll just make up a completely random figure here. Ten, you you decided that you were going to pl plant five percent of your property to trees in total. If it's all restricted down to one corner of your property, then the edge of that five percent is just the um, however much. Uh, is uh, coinciding with that. But then if you could quickly imagine that your 5% of trees are spread everywhere all over the property, then, then you have uh, edges everywhere on all of those trees. So it's maximizing almost like the surface area, if you could imagine, by spreading things around. And that edge effect means that you always get more biological activity on an edge, because some of the organisms that use, if we were just using trees as the example, and a grassland, some of the birds, bugs and bees and all the rest of it that use the trees will actually venture out into the grassland and have activity there. And likewise, some of the grassland organisms will go into the trees, which means that you just have more cycling of the uh, nutrients, which is really what what you're about. You're really trying to have a, a, a business and a landscape that is maximizing functionality. And from the business point of view, it means that you don't have to buy as much stuff. If you've got more basis that is being supplied by nature, then uh, uh, straight away, you don't have to uh, have such a dependence on external inputs. So that's the business proposition. Mm. So this uh, particular slide that you have um, and returning here because um, uh, to livestock behavior and how they drive edge effects right at the uh, uh, at the uh, the base level when they're interacting in the grassland because if they're rejecting some plants there may be very good reason that those plants may never be eaten but uh, our work over the last 20 years has shown that we can actively take a role with our animals and expand the range of plants that they actually eat. Now, this applies even if you've had animals on your place for a long time and you say, yeah, oh, uh, um, I don't see them eating uh, this particular plant, Bruce. Yep, well, it may be a palatability issue, but it may be a number of other factors and behavioural stuff is one of those uh, really big uh, uh, indicators. Just because animals have had experience doesn't necessarily mean it's been a good experience, but we can take an active role in changing that. And so if you even get the animals to sample just a little bit of some plants that they haven't been uh, utilizing much, if at all, previously, then once again, you've changed the whole dynamics of that whole grassland you've taken off a tiny bit of pressure off the, the more palatable plants, but also you've changed the whole inside of those animals. You've changed what's happened in the rumen because there are a range of uh, plant-derived compounds and they're often called phytochemicals, uh, phyto, um, uh, a Greek word. So this huge range of compounds that each plant puts together Right, so it's not vitamins, it's not minerals we're talking about. We're talking about things that are the number in their thousands. So each plant that you look at in your paddock has thousands of, of these compounds or more uh, 
in part of its uh, just structure. So if the animal start to eat some more of that, it starts to go in and interact with all the other compounds, but then be deposited out the other end, giving you more and more cycling. And guess what? The bugs and the grubs and the microbes that get access to that stuff that's been cycled that otherwise would be just standing there in a plant that hasn't been eaten, they start to activate more processes in the soil biome. So we're actually driving a bit of an upward cycle here by changing behaviours. We start to change the whole grassland and give even more diversity across a landscape rather than less. And it changes the physiology and in fact even changes the genome by epigenetic change, uh, which is, if you like, for those that haven't heard that term before, you can look it up, epigenetic, so EPI, genetic change. Um, those are the switches on the, the genome that uh, influence our whole evolution. So it's co-evolution in real time, and you can set your animals on different, more beneficial paths and your landscape at the same time. So what, when we're uh, utilizing self-herding and those sort of things, what are we doing? This little bit of film here is a, uh, uh, a wind chime set up uh, in um, the Northern Territory. And um, that's the reaction of the animals coming in to that signal. And this time when it pans across to the left, you will see they get a little reward and little reward is the real key here. They're not getting a great big feed, but it's their anticipation of coming in for a reward, which is the really, really exciting bit. And that's what we're driving with these animals. So yes, they're getting that, that little bit of a taste of something exciting. And there's an animal with a, uh, a, a GPS uh, collar on its, um, uh, uh, on its um, uh, neck. And here are two more examples and a uh, bit of... Uh, bit of sound there um, uh, with those animals coming in and see the excitement. And this is in now in Western Australia in a different station. And they've been brought in just here briefly with literally a half a bucket of uh, oats in this particular case. Um, and I want you to see what's happening on that ground level. So they've been brought here for a bit of fun on a, um, uh, a school holidays with some city visitors on this sta station. Let's have some fun. Let's call the cattle in and do some rehabilitation disturbance work on a scald. And you can see that there's um, some little patches of blondy stuff, which is the remnants of the oats, but it's all the excited activity there, which is actually a mini herd effect for those of you uh, that know about holistic management, you'll know, should know the difference between herd effect and animal impact. And so what we've engineered there with a self herding tool is to bring the animals and just apply a very small, for a small period of time, herd effect on a scalded area to actually disturb the topsoil, deposit a small bit of uh, uh, nutrient and dung in order that that is um, catalyzed to make a change uh, from, uh, from there. And so this is what it looks like afterwards when you're applying it on, this is a, uh, uh, another difference, two sets of different stations again. And uh, from the past two years work, worth of work where uh, uh, the uh, landholders there were using uh, attracted herd effect uh, to uh, work on the, the top spreading uh, parts of gullies, just where they start to fan out and they actually eat into these landscapes. Once uh, gullies and water flows on these arid landscapes, uh, those processes have started, it's really, really insidious and, and a real uh, detriment to uh, uh, the landscape. And if you're uh, utilising uh, machinery to do that, um, you can uh, rehabilitate sites. But of course, the scale across Australia is just so massive that uh, that can't be applied everywhere. And even if you won the lottery a few times, you couldn't afford it. But there's some, uh, 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 the left-hand photo is an after on a, um, uh, a quite successful little remediation. And they used a, a small quantity of hay there as well 
in that attraction uh, bringing to that that site. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom one wasn't. It was more like the film you've just seen where they are attracted in and called in. Uh, and so uh, some really, really sophisticated tools under the whole umbrella of uh, self-herding, which uh, contains quite a lot of different uh, 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 tools that you can apply. Now, changing out because we're starting to uh, run towards some uh, time and we should uh, allow for a little bit of discussion or uh, question time. Um, this is uh, uh, something I need to uh, uh, to mention because it's something that um, in my travels right across Australia, which are, are pretty uh, wide and I'm very, very fortunate to go in and out of uh, agricultural areas and in and out of pastoral areas. We have major uh, unfolding uh, issues and uh, uh, with passive chemical exposures in the ag areas. And uh, so uh, for those of you in uh, New South Wales uh, uh, and uh, driving about the landscape in the central areas in, in particular, uh, just take note of the uh, extreme uh, impact uh, across the landscape uh, in this summer. We've had three summers in a row of wet weather, so it shouldn't be any surprise that there's been a lot of, of chemical placed out across the, the landscape and it is having an effects long way away from where it's being applied. So that's the difference between passive chemical exposures versus uh, overspray. Uh, if we're talking overspray, that's um, uh, something quite visually you get from, uh, uh, you know, from your neighbour or from some identifiable uh, source. But passive chemical exposures are the spread of uh, synthetic chemicals or tens of kilometres or further away from where they've been applied. So this isn't uh, something where we're just pointing the finger at a, an individual person, individual chemical, or a particular way it's applied. This is something that is um, drastically affecting our, uh, uh, our landscape and just needs to be mentioned because in the la in land care context, we're... Uh, uh, you're sort of the audience and myself are obviously trying to do things to expand uh, the diversity and uh, 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 for many different reasons across our landscape. And if those are uh, uh, are uh, being uh, uh, prevented by, uh, by deaths from things that we can't control, that's an issue that we're going to have to face up, up to and it affects everything right up to, uh, to climate change. And so... Um, this is sort of a recent photo and that's taken down on the edge of Gulgong for anybody uh, wanting to uh, to know uh, about two and a half hours, three hours drive south of where I live. And that's a Currajong tree. And so anybody wanting to uh, identify damage through the landscape at the moment, well, that's one, one species that you can easily identify, but there are many, many more. So going on to the uh, positive, um, it is all about people, people, people from uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if there's a, a longer lesson that uh, maybe I've taken uh, a long time to learn in my career is that it's it's all about you. If we I was meeting you in person, um, uh, it's it's no point in me talking about uh, any particular um, uh, strategies or uh, methods to uh, 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 to approach things. It's got to be what's relevant to you and. Uh, Regeneration is about the next generation, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm really, really passionately wanting to see us have stronger communities, which means more people on the land, more people interested in caring for the land across in the uh, uh, in the total across our great country, because, boy, we do live in a lucky time. We've got some major challenges and we are going to have to do change, but that's more uh, a fun thing to look forward to rather than to be feared. So. Just some uh, rehashing uh, some of these main points to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the first point there, well, why would diversity be important? Well, it's because that first point applies. Every plant will bring different stuff in uh, different, uh, at different concentrations at different times to the soil surface. That's what plants do. They accumulate from the air and the atmosphere as well as from the ground. So for us, to make more of, of our uh, real estate that we've either uh, bought one way or another, uh, diversity brings more stability and resilience across uh, our land. And therefore, to, uh, uh, to actually enhance that, 
you can use animal management. And so grazing management extends to everything that applies to the human animal interaction and behavior being the biggest one. So if you're interested in enhanced grazing management and that sort of thing, think behavior as well as the other static tools that we would use, such as wire and water. And then as far as scale goes, uh, very much uh, would, would uh, put to you that, that if uh, the only way to succeed in rural business is to keep on scaling out and keeping on buying uh, the bigger fish, buying the smaller fish, it's an, uh, uh, a no-win game in the long run because eventually uh, if you're the only one standing, well, good luck to you, but you don't have a community for your uh, for your uh, uh, family and uh, next generations to really enjoy and thrive in. Uh, thriving in our landscapes means that we want a really vibrant human landscape as well. So by thinking about scaling up, that's a possibility uh, instead of intensification. So uh, our well-being in total is uh, enhanced by uh, by the uh, resilience and also by a variety across our landscapes. If we keep on simplifying our landscapes, there's more than enough science and medical research to indicate that that is a worse and worse result for us as, as humans. So agriculture and agroecology agro are really exciting places to be. I hope that we can encourage uh, not only ourselves, but our next generations and our friends that, that don't live in rural areas to uh, know and hear about uh, the exciting developments that we're doing large or small and in all uh, different ways. They're all important and they're all useful. And so I really uh, encourage you to, um, uh, to hopefully continue on whichever journeys and wherever you are uh, going with, with all of this. And um, I will do my best to uh, keep on making sure that we bring more tools into the toolboxes at your disposal. And uh, thank you very much for your time uh, today and spending uh, that with us. And uh, I'll pass over to Liz for any uh, questions or discussions in the remaining time. Thank you so much, Bruce. That was incredible. Um, just so many different areas. We've received one question so far, and please, this is an opportunity to get your questions in. Um, do you see a fit for no-kill cropping in low rainfall areas without a livestock component of the business? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, I do. And I think that might be uh, very applicable, especially when we get into uh, some very arid areas. Or, And it mightn't be that it's a zero livestock uh, option, but the, the uh, livestock might only very infrequently travel across that land. Uh, so yes, if we leave the grassland totally uh, uh, intact there, it will be impacted by um, uh, unmanaged grazers. So whether that be um, native ones such as kangaroos and wallabies and that sort of thing, or exotic ones such as goats or pigs or deer or uh, whatever else is, is there there will still be grazing going on and consumption of uh, that, that grassland. And of course, insect activity there is there. And so um, if one were going down that path, uh, one threat to that is unmanaged fires across that landscape. So if you don't have livestock as a tool, then you'll need to closely consider what you may or may not do with fire regimes. Because if we continue to build biomass there, then of course, that is a, um, a fuel load that uh, is good above, uh, above ground and doing great work for us, uh, organic matter above and below ground and, and feeds things. But if it is at risk of being totally consumed by uh, uh, fires, then we have uh, uh, perhaps a, uh, uh, another reason for thinking about potentially having livestock as a tool, but maybe you don't um, uh, apply that very frequently at all. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, uh, the question is really, really apt and a, a very good one. The more arid the area, the more that uh, one could uh, uh, make a case for 
uh, uh, less livestock or near to, to zero or very infrequent. Fantastic, thank you. We did you, um, when did you begin to use feed to draw cattle in and did you learn this from someone or discovered it yourself? Uh, great question again, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, the whole self herding techniques have come from uh, uh, standing on the shoulders of a lot of uh, people. Uh, one principally, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm on screen at the moment, but um, uh, if not, uh, this can be shown afterwards, but it's a, uh, uh, a book by Fred Provenza. So I worked very closely with uh, Fred Provenza, who is Utah State University. His book is called Nourishment. Highly recommend that for anybody really seeking to understand the deep interplay of uh, uh, animals, plants, soil, and uh, us humans. Uh, but uh, uh, so Fred was very, very in instrumental in, in that. And, uh, and also I uh, uh, have to mention uh, Dr. Dean Ravel, who co-developed uh, self-herding with me. And his background was in Australian native forage shrubs. If you wish to know more about those in particular, that program was called the Enrich Program. So E-N-R-I-C-H. And uh, you can still Google up and get free resources on that uh, project, which examined uh, Australian native shrubs and their forage potential, and which uh, uh, of which there are very uh, great many. So there was a number of these things, um, as well as things such as um, uh, swarm theory and behavioural analysis. So a lot of behavioural science came into it. Um, it's a pretty quick and easy notion to uh, to get the thing. Oh yes, if we uh, if we get them used to coming the, to the feed bucket and give them a a signal. Uh, blowing the whistle or calling them up, that can happen. And that's that's a, um, uh, an observation, but think more heavily about my uh, saying we want to get a an addictive behaviour rather than just having to reward them all the time because out in the real field conditions, it's too expensive and too logistically uh, difficult to keep on taking foodstuffs all over the, the landscape. You only want to occasionally do that in the same way that if you've uh, taught your dog to sit or any other, other trick, well, it doesn't get a, a food reward all the time once it has the behaviour. So the food rewards are the means to the end, not the, uh, the way that we achieve the result all the time. Thanks, Bruce. Um, how do you get cat the cattle to eat plants they don't habitually eat? If you motivate them with a reward, whoops, I just lost my chat. Um, <laughs> if you, sorry, I'm just. Yes. Sorry, the screen just changed and I lost it all. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Uh, I, I can hear you. If you'd like okay, to yeah. So um, if you motivate them with a reward, a treat, how does the transfer to eating alternative pasture how does yep. that transfer to eating Terrific. Yep. Uh, great question again. So the, the real uh, uh, thing here is we're pairing up the, the occasional treats to a very distinct signal. Now, this might be a particular one like you've seen in the, uh, uh, in the videos where we have uh, called the animals to uh, that, that spot, or it might be a static signal, more like uh, uh, in the human context, something like a McDonald's sign. Uh, whether you like it or not, I hope you just get the the the, uh, the point there of the Macca's sign is that that one knows behind that that sign is predictability, but also variability, because Macca's run specials, yeah, but it has a regular menu as well, so it has a high attraction point for those that have a regularized behaviour to come towards it. So, with uh, uh, getting animals to um, uh, eat. Uh, a wider range is is getting uh, them to experiment in the first way. So there's multiple paths here. You can do it just by using high level three stress free stockmanship uh, uh, methods. But also then when we go on to the level four stuff, we can actually start to use some other dietary tricks. And on a uh, another seminar at some great depth, we would talk about the use of Bruce's brew, which is a very highly technical thing. 
but uh, something you can make for free uh, on your own own home. And uh, we use uh, some tools such as that to uh, assist the animals to have access to a detoxifying agent, as well as taking them around the landscape so that they continue to experiment. We're changing behaviours here to, if you like, make it more like uh, somebody who's been a world traveller rather than uh, uh, comparatively somebody that's just only lived in, in one little town and never gone outside the, the town outskirts. The experience is different. And when you broaden experience, you start to get more experimental behaviours and you're starting to initiate a feedback loop where they will combine a lot of these plants, which often have high toxin loads, but they can be handled at small doses. So uh, that's what we're trying to initiate. Fantastic, very exciting, thank you. Um, here's one, we are new property holders and starting off on a farm by increasing biodiversity rather than grazing and cropping on poor overgrazed clay soil near Yass. Do you have any advice for starting off on a new property? <laughs> Yes, okay. Uh, first bit of advice, yeah, tw twice as much capital and, uh, and uh, <laughs> four times as much uh, time. And uh, <laughs> no, um, look, as a general thing, I only, can only answer in, in principle here that, that um, uh, from a degraded starting point that we really want to uh, try and let as many plants grow as possible. That's what we're after. And and it's the grassland, it's that ground layer that that uh, I would encourage you to work on, first of all, rather than necessarily going and planting a heap of trees or shrubs straight away. By all means, if you're doing it for other uh, amenity reasons and, and shade or other reasons like that, that's good. But really, that soil um, needs rehabilitation. And how are we going to rehab that? We are going to do that by trying to allow a bigger range of, of plants. So animals are one of the tools that we drive a bigger diversity rather than, than less, but it depend, depends how they're used. Now, the obvious thing is if we leave animals on there all the time and they have their habits and their own particular likes and dislikes as far as palatable plants, then of course, they're gonna to start to take some of that diversity out of the landscape by making sure that we're moving the animals across the uh, the landscape, giving intervals for the plants to really flourish, then that that's, the, if you like, the starting point principles that I'd, I'd guide you uh, towards. And uh, oftentimes it's a, just a case of us taking our foot off the spring, as it were, giving plants enough time to really thrive enough that they can really punch their roots down into the ground and really have enough time to grow and set seed or produce enough biomass there to really start putting some uh, uh, some organic matter on top of the ground as well as their roots punching below. Great start. Thanks, Bruce. And um, we've got a few more that we'll answer if we can. Um, with the with that accumulated biomass over the years, have issues sowing through stubble already. How have people been managing that? Yes, great question again. And uh, so in regard to no-kill cropping, one of the principles is straight running culter equipment. So uh, won't describe that at length. You can go uh, looking on um, uh, my regenerative farming channel on, on YouTube as an example. There's some, some uh, uh, videos there and uh, other people have, have posted but importantly we're talking about straight running coulter equipment so uh, so a coulter is a, a flat uh, disc a cutting disc so we have two of those together and the uh, and they're tilted outwards at the top and seed is deposited in the very brief furrow that that uh, um, that those two discs as they roll across the surface provide so when you're, you're doing uh, that dry, um, uh, getting through stubble loads with uh, appropriate equipment uh, is, uh, is not a problem, but there is a, a very key word, appropriate equipment. There's probably, uh, goodness knows, maybe 120 different types of, of disc machinery on the, uh, available to you on the market. And uh, those appropriate for no kill 
probably in about the half a dozen uh, so, uh, of those. So uh, because what we're after with a no-kill approach is as zero disturbance, essentially, as minimal uh, impact as possible, but with the uh, uh, maximum overlay and going through that material. Because it's a really great question because we want to leave everything. We don't want to feel, oh, gosh, we've got to graze the hell out of this in order that we can get machinery through there because you're just setting yourself in train to simplify and give yourself problems with sets of weeds that are going to occupy that site because you're overgrazing it. Fantastic. Now, there was one asking for where they can get information on um, uh, regarding self-herding. So I'll get a link from you to be able to send some information out in email. Is that... Yes, that's uh, that's fine. Yep. And, okay. uh, yep. So, and go ahead. The last question is: Existing perennial pastures seem to outcompete no-kill crops here in the southern tablelands of New South Wales. Your thoughts, Bruce? Right. Um. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd probably uh, be unable to answer that that specific one there. Why uh, they haven't been having. Uh, success. I'd need to understand more about how it has been uh, applied. But in in general, it will be um, uh, uh, if they haven't been having success, it'll be uh, uh, categories of things that are uh, potentially less than uh, than optimum. So it could be the machinery, or it it uh, or it could uh, be the um, uh, uh, the the grazing management that underpins there that we uh, have a dominance of particular uh, species uh, potentially yep it could be that that folks have been um, uh, applying it as a moist sowing uh, example in which case that's a, a pasture cropping a, approach but they uh, might have thought they were doing no kill uh, so um, uh, the and we could keep on adding an, a number of other other bits and and please whomever's asked the question don't don't, uh, I'm not uh, suggesting or, or uh, uh, coming across as as critical because I don't really until knowing the the uh, the way this has been done and what has been attempted in terms of even the plants that have been been sown and the the pasture base uh, what um, uh, what consequences because uh, yes because you do have uh, uh, things in those parts of the world of uh, plants such as phalaris. Uh, uh, and those sort of um, uh, uh, type of uh, plants, which can become quite uh, heavily dominant across a, uh, a grassland, but um, yes, but that's not usually a a reason to uh, for it not to work. And and the the first hint of of whether it can work in your area or not is uh, do you have annuals coming up uh, in that uh, that grassland or pasture? So of, of any kind, whether that be uh, uh, desirable or undesirable. And the answer inevitably will be, yes, if you have a grassland, you will have annuals coming and going. And so there, there is the key. So what, what we're seeking to do is establish the, our more desirable annuals in there as a, as a bigger component. Wow, so many variables. I'm going to have to call it a close. We've gone 11 minutes over. Thank you, everybody, for um, joining us today. I will send out a link once it's uploaded online, along with the survey. We'd really like your feedback to help us shape future programs. Bruce Maynard, I can't thank you enough. It's been wonderful, and I'm sure to, sorry to cut it off. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you uh, to Landcare, and, and thanks, everybody, for spending your time with us uh, today. Hope to meet you in person in the future.